our department and the external of the science and technology, in fact, the lead is here today also. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this eighth, uh, um, eighth lecture uh, for this year. Um, before I start the introduction and so forth, let me mention that maybe uh, uh, Agilent Technologies has been sponsoring uh, this uh, series since the start in uh, 2006, and uh, we are very thankful to them. Uh, they, uh, before I talk about the speaker uh, for today, uh, let me mention that uh, on March the 3rd, Thursday, March the 3rd, uh, I have invited a lot of professors on, from the physics department uh, because a lot of the students and people and so on were, were asking me, okay, uh, can we hear something about, uh, you know, uh, about the ethical problems and whatever, uh, because generally when you look at the uh, I mean, uh, internet, it's like a double-edged sword. And then, uh, uh, he has, he has, I think maybe he has driven, driven written a book or whatever on this thing and I thought that it's, it's worth to invite him because a lot of, uh, a lot of us uh, who are in the information uh, technology and so forth, uh, we really need to know about that. Uh, uh, for today, uh, I have, uh, we have invited Dr. Uh, Robert Sargent uh, from UPSU uh, to uh, give us a talk on uh, optical uh, filters and uh, their applications. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, I am uh, thankful to him because this, in fact, is the second uh, time that he has been here. I think the first time that we did it was in 2007, if I remember correctly. Anyhow, uh, Dr. Uh, Sargent uh, received his bachelor's, de uh, bachelor's degree in physics from the University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD in optical sciences uh, in the center from the University of Arizona, uh, in Tucson. Uh, for those of you who do not know the Optical Science Center, uh, in fact, in those days uh, that he graduated, in fact, I was also a, uh, doing my sabbatical there, and even maybe till now, there are two optic center, two main optics, in those days, two main optic center in, in the country. One was uh, the optical, uh, is the Optical Science Center, and the other one is the Optics Institute in Rochester. And they were, in those days, they were really the top notch schools and school uh, still they are they are they are uh, very good ones. Uh, so uh, uh, he has been with uh, uh, with Oakley uh, and G JDSU since uh, 1980 uh, serving in a variety of engineering and leadership roles. His work uh, has uh, concentrated on the development of uh, energetic thin field deposition process processes and methods for depositing narrowband and uh, precision filters. Additionally, he has enjoyed working with uh, companies and universities to employ filter technology in applications such as uh, optical instrumentation, wavelength division and multiplexing uh, for, uh, for fiber optic telecommunications and uh, consumer electronics. Dr. Sargent is currently uh, the manager of uh, processes, uh, process development for JD, uh, JDSU's uh, custom optics school. So here is Dr. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I guess we should put the face slide set up. Thank you. So today, talk a little bit about optical filters and some of the applications they find themselves in. Um, a lot of times this technology is sort of hidden uh, in devices and things where you don't see it every day, so hopefully after this talk you'll at least have a couple of ideas of, of how this technology is used. Um, it was mentioned that maybe I should say a couple of words about JDSU for those of you who have, haven't heard of it or are familiar with the company. JDSU is a company of about 4,000 people, has three main groups, one that makes communication components that go into long haul and other kinds of communication networks. Another group uh, makes test equipment for communications networks, those same kind of networks. And then the group I work with is called Advanced Optical Technologies. Uh, most of that was formerly known as OCLI, a long time Sonoma County company. 
uh, in the year 2000, we merged into JDSU. And within the group I'm in now, this advanced optical technologies, there's a, a custom optics products group. Most of the discussion we're going to have here is about products and technologies that relate to that. But in addition to that, we also uh, make pigments that uh, uh, go on currency, and occasionally you'll see a car painted with it, for example, in a decorative kind of application. And we also make various kinds of anti-counterfeiting devices of different types. So, sort of an introduction to JDSU and to uh, the advanced optical technologies. So, um, this is the abstract that you probably read already when you decided, you made that key decision to come to the seminar and listen to this talk. So I, I won't say it over again. Let's jump in and just uh, say I'd like to spend a few minutes introducing and motivating optical coatings and how they're used. Talk a little bit about what they are, um, how they work, that kind of thing. Um, spend some time on how we make them, the process technologies we use to make optical coatings. Uh, a uh, very short few minutes on some of the important characteristics of optical coatings, and a little bit about something that we've developed in the last five or so years in the coating platform. So, a lot to cover in so little time. Um, so, optical coatings. <coughs> Telescope mirrors like this one, this is the 8.3 meter mirror blank for the binocular telescope that's currently on one target. These are the people back there who were involved in making this thing, right? So, so this whole giant mirror and this whole giant structure that the mirror goes into and this whole framework that holds the giant structure that the mirror goes into, they exist for one reason. That's to support a one ounce optical coating, okay? Just to, to reflect that light into the optic system to create the images of the galaxies that are far, far away and to try and uh, image planets that are near stars, right? So all that structure is just to support our optical coating. So that's how important these optical coatings are if you have any questions about it. Um, an interesting thing about the way they're making these telescopes now is these shells that the mirror goes into are actually little vacuum chambers. And what the folks do is about once or twice, and maybe once every one or two years, they have to uh, remake that coating because it's made of silver and it degrades over time. So what they do is they actually have a clamshell that comes down, you can see it over here, and forms a vacuum chamber, and then they deposit some aluminum or, or silver in a vacuum process, and then remove that shell up out of the way, and then, uh, then it's good as new again, and they're ready to shoot images of stars again. So here's an image of the uh, uh, the telescope at dusk, ready to start taking pictures. Here's another picture showing it, uh, showing some of the superstructure. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that motivates uh, <coughs> optical coatings from one perspective of, in science. Another one is um, motivating it from the perspective of just practical everyday uses. Um, so if you look at that lady um, in the picture above. The picture on the left, I would say she looks pretty happy. But, you know, with that glare in her eyes, that smile is just not as big as it could be. But on the right-hand side, with that anti-reflection coating on those glasses, that smile's just a little bigger. She's just a little happier. She's not having that ice cream every day. You know what I'm saying? So, so anyway, this is a particular AR coating made by a company called Essilor. They're a big lens manufacturer. So, so it's, it's nice, it's a nice feature, it, it helps. In, a, in some applications, this kind of anti-reflection coating is more than just a good idea, it's all practically absolutely essential. Um, and a good example is, is camera lenses here. A lot of camera lenses have 10 or 15 elements that are inside this, and, and if you didn't, if you had the glare that you see from that <coughs> one lens bouncing back and forth in all those lens elements, you just get hash by the time you get to the film plane, or I guess today it's the CCD plane, right? So um, in this kind of application, these anti-reflection coatings are really key. Um, one of Oakley's or JDSU's platforms for making this kind of coating is, 
is the multi-layer automatic coder. This is a, a very large system where we can uh, uh, coat large sheets of glass for customers, for example, in the display industry. Another kind of application is shown here where we're, we're separating out um, different colors um, using a prism that might look something like this. This is called a Phillips prism that separates red, green, and blue light uh, from, a, uh, from a white beam. So here I think you can see, if I aim it right, that on the screen back here there's a green that's the part that's transmitted through. And if we look uh, uh, over here, you have to go to a black place to see it. We've got blue coming out of this face of this prism. And uh, I'm not sure if I can aim this one right, but I'll try. And you can see the red coming out here. So this, this prism uh, can be used, for example, in a color TV camera to separate out three images to three different imagers in the color TV camera, or in a projector. So color separation, another kind of application. Finally, one more kind of application is uh, the reason Ockley was uh, merged with JDSU is because we made filters for telecommunications, extremely narrow band filters that, that are constructed of multiple uh, cavity stacks. These could have 100 layers in these structures to finally discriminate one narrow band of wavelengths from another narrow band. Uh, so that you might have 100 channels, for example, being transmitted down one fiber uh, to make the system more efficient. So hopefully we're motivated now, ready to move on to uh, you know what thin films are and, and how they're used, that kind of thing. So, so what is? Does anyone have an example of, of what a thin film is that they can already think of? All right. But you got um, like a thin layer of oil on a pool of water, like when it rains? Yes. Yes. So right now might be a good time, except it's been raining a lot, so a lot of the oil got washed away. Mm -hmm. It's especially good after a first rain, because then the oil has had a lot of time to get on the pavement, and then it rises to the top of the water, and you have a super thin layer of oil that has interference effects. Good. Any other ones? Glasses line. Glasses lens, that's a good pr practical application. There's uh, examples in nature, insect uh, wings and the like. But one good one is bubble stuff. So I'm not too good at this one. So you see the colors in that bubble? There's uh, all sorts of co colors, right? <laughs> see purple and green and all that kind of color. That's coming from the interference between the outside of that bubble and the very closely spaced to it inside of that bubble. That's, that's interference. So what I've been doing for the last 21 years is making money out of bubble stuff. Okay? <laughs> now what we have to do though is instead of using bubble stuff, we have to use durable materials like refractory metal oxides and silicon, blah, blah, blah. So we have to make it a little more real, but, but still the basic idea is bubble stuff. So from a technical perspective, what's, what's a thin film? We say it's a thin layer of, of a material on the surface. In many cases, it's usually a transparent layer. Um, they're a nice way of, a versatile way of controlling light. And the main kind of things we do are control the reflectance, the transmission, the transmittance, and the absorptance as a function of wavelength and polarization. So if you wanted a technical definition, there you go. Uh -oh, I think I'm going to click my two slides. I got this Got it. OK. We got it. OK. So um, by the way, Optical coatings span a super broad spectrum. It's not just visible optics. Um, we've made reflecting coatings out of thin metals for the Chandra uh, X-ray telescope, for example, that's uh, 
This particular one is an image of the sun, but usually it's out looking for things like gamma ray bursters, uh, looking away from the sun. Um, all the way out into the same kind of ideas are used in, in millimeter wave and radio wave. We don't make that kind of product, but uh, those electrical engineers out there may have heard of half wave and quarter wave uh, 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 layers on, that are used on microwave dishes and the like. So this is a cross section of a thin film filter. Uh, this is an example type, uh, which is very common where we have oh, an alternating stack, we call it a reflecting stack, a spacing layer, uh, and another one, this kind of structure is called a fabric pearl filter. Um, these layers uh, are typically hundreds of atoms thick and require plus or minus, on average, uh, an atom type of precision for at least telecom type filters. Um, the size of this relative to a human hair, um, this is a ANSI standard 62 micron thick human hair. I guess human hair actually varies from 20 to 200 microns in thickness. But anyway, this gives you an idea on a scale of, of something real that you can imagine. Some materials that we use to make optical coatings, our company especially, but I think most optical coatings are, are simply of inorganic materials. So materials like silicon, silicon dioxide, uh, various fluorides like magnesium fluoride, silicon, and germanium in the infrared spectral region. Um, some you may not have heard of, like uh, cadmium sulfide. Titanium dioxide is actually used in paint. It's a very common material, non-toxic material. Um, we make coatings for all sorts of applications, and that necessitates uh, all sorts of surface shapes that we must put the coatings on top of. So, so this, for example, um, is that Chandra X-ray telescope mirror. It's kind of hard to see it in this picture to imagine it, but it's actually kind of a cylindrical shaped optic. Uh, and here's some other examples of flat, round, curved, cylindrical optics that we've, that we've uh, deposited coatings on top of. Also necessitates depositing coatings on many different substrate materials. So here's a whole bunch of them here, but just to take a couple of examples, uh, one would be silicon that has a, a transmittance range from about one micron out to about 30 microns. And a very common material that's used well, for infrared coatings. Another example would be fused silica, uh, which is uh, shown right here that has uh, very good transmittance all the way into the uh, almost to the vacuum UV really out to about three or four micrometers uh, and all sorts of other substrates are used as well. So how does a, an optical thin film work? Well what do you think of this thin layer as a uh, part of the soap bubble? Okay in the bubble stuff, or we can think of it as a, a thin layer on a substrate, or the, the layer on the oil, or at the, here's the water, and here's the oil. These are all the same geometry we're talking about here now. So we have an incoming light wave, and the two key things are this interface and that interface. There's a reflection from the top interface, and a reflection from the bottom interface, and what is the phase relationship of that reflection? That's the key thing. If the thickness and the phase shifts are correct so that these are opposite in magnitude, that's destructive interference. If they reinforce each other, uh, that's constructive. So, sorry, this is destructive interference. The other way is, is constructive interference. So a picture that shows that um, is coming up. Key, key features of each film layer are the reflectance, the amount of reflectance at each um, interface, and then um, any phase change that occurs at that interface. And many, many of you have seen from taking electromagnetism, of course, for example. And also the film thickness, the, the farther the light has a chance to travel into that layer. So we're not going to talk about too much more physics beyond that, but if you got a little bit of that, you kind of got a basis of how these interference filters work. This just helps give you an idea of the constructive interference 
phenomenon when the, the phases of the light beams are lined up, then they reinforce. When it's destructive, they're alternating, and you get nothing. So what happens when you line everything up so that the reflectance is zero? The one reflected beam cancels the other reflected beam. What happens to the transmitted beam? What happens? What happens to the transmitted beam? There's a portion of it that goes in, right? Crosses the surface. Okay. Anything else? Everything will be transmitted back. Everything's transmitted. That's right. Magic. Because we've defeated the reflection, all, instead of only getting 92 or 96% transmittance, you get 100% transmittance. Neglecting the absorption and whatever effects like that you might have. So that's a very powerful thing. You're not only eliminating the glare from the lady's glasses, you're actually getting 100% of the light through those glasses. So in a lot of applications, not so much for the lady, but for a lot of applications, that's really important. So, interference, uh, this interference is our design tool. We have a couple of main properties of these layers. One is the index of refraction of the layer, that Snell's Law thing that many, many of you have seen. Another one, you may not have seen this, uh, we call it the K or the extinction ratio, or uh, extinction coefficient sometimes, uh, as a measure of the absorption in the layer. So, uh, uh, that's another important property. Now, we have to study these equations in depth. Just kidding. <laughs> well, what the point is, is all this math has been worked out. Thousands of guys have programmed this, and maybe some ladies too, and have programmed this up. And, and uh, we have programs that you can use that are off the shelf that we can use to do these calculations and figure out what to do. So this is a mature field in that respect. The math and the, the uh, that kind of stuff is really well known. So, performance of a thin film, function of wavelength, thickness, the optical constants that we talked about, the angle of incidence of the light, the polarization state of the light, all these things factor in, okay? Um, these films also have thermal effects that can be important in applications where your coating has to operate over a wide range of temperatures. Um, this just gives you an idea of what the angle shift can look like. So here's a, uh, a chart showing uh, wavelength in nan nanometers and the, the transmittance values of the coating. And this shows uh, the performance at zero degrees angle of incidence, 30 degrees angle of incidence, and 45. So you can see the coating performance is shifting to shorter wavelengths. That's a for kind of a fundamental thing. You learn that the first day when you come into Ockley. I mean, JDSU. Mm -hmm. So this, this is actually in the red part of the spectrum. So, wow, we've done all that. Now we're ready to move on to coding types and their applications. So, um, lots of applications, and we're just going to touch on a few here. One is uh, uh, gas sensing and spectroscopy. Most of these kind of applications are in the infrared because the kinds of molecular vibrations and stuff like that occur in that spectral region. So, one example is an anesthesia monitor. And in this case, uh, you're looking at a line at around 10.2 micrometers, uh, and uh, typically these instruments shine, shine a beam, an infrared beam, through the gas that's uh, being transported uh, to you when you're on the operating table, and uh, <coughs> detecting how much of that gas you present, you can make sure that it's just right. You don't want the guy waking up. Okay, you don't want to, you know, put him out all the way either. You got to keep it just at the right level. Um, so, in some cases, those are fixed filters. In some cases, we can make uh, variable filters that actually have a variation in their spectral properties as a function of position on the substrate. Basically, we do that by wedging the filter uh, when we make it. So, um, Excuse me. there's... Yeah. Is that Actually. also... Uh, like, if you have a variable filter, does it mean that you move that... Uh, that thing that causes the wedge? A couple ways to use that kind of filter. One way is to translate it back and forth across a fixed detector. Uh -huh. Another way now, we have these 
CCD arrays, right, that are either linear arrays or uh, cameras, mm -hmm. and you can actually use those and use the filter and have a, a nice spectrometer with no moving parts. So um, there are applications also where a, a surgeon might be performing a surgery using a laser. Or in the military, sometimes there's well, lasers that are used on the battlefield. In both these kind of cases, you want to protect that person, uh, the surgeon uh, or the soldier, from these, um, from these laser beams. So what, what we can make with this technology is, is um, filters that can block light at one wavelength to one part in a million, 10 to the 6, one part in a million, while at nearby wavelengths transmitting 95 or more percent of the light. So the surgeon can see pretty well to do all their stuff, but they're not going to get blinded by that 532 nanometer YAG laser that, that's doing the, uh, whatever work it's doing on the patient, ablating bad things away from me. Um, also, uh, an area of application is in uh, satellites uh, for uh, example, uh, protecting solar cells. In the space environment is a, a little bit nasty in that there's, uh, for example, hydrogen atoms floating around and uh, high energy particles of various types. Uh, so uh, what, what these, and also UV light, a lot of UV light. So what these uh, solar cell covers can do is a very thin piece of glass can be put on top of the solar cell to protect it from those things. What's, what you typically want to do is reduce the reflectance of the top of that cover. And so we make a, an anti-reflection coating that does that. Um, so we make uh, these kind of covers for gallium arsenide solar cells as well as silicon solar cells. Um, another example that's also used in space, um, satellites have a lot of surfaces that can capture sunlight. And when they're indirect sunlight, they can get very, very hot. Um, so what we can do is we can put panels, we make panels that can be applied to the satellite that reflects the solar uh, radiation, uh, but allows the, the satellite body itself to emit away radiation so that it can cool itself naturally uh, through radiative cooling. Uh, this is kind of a fun example. We've, at various times, enable uh, a number of companies that make this kind of stage lighting uh, by, by making colored lights that you, sometimes they change the color by shifting the angle of the interference filter or sometimes we put patterns on the filters that have enabled them in some way or another to, to make things called gobos I guess it is that, that put patterns uh, on the stage so uh, that's a, a very uh, kind of a more fun application. Another example is a kind of, a different kind of coating than we've talked about so far. It's a transparent conductive coating. So this kind of <coughs> is intuitive. Uh, a coating that conducts electrons but transmits visible light. Well, what are most of the materials that you can think of that are gonna conduct electrons? Metals. Like metals? And they're not transparent. I mean, Star Trek had transparent aluminum, I guess, but, <laughs> but other than that, and that hasn't been invented yet, right? So, uh, so most of those materials are opaque, conduct electrons. These, there are a few materials, though, like indium tin oxide and some other unusual materials that have some limited conductivity of electrons, but also transmit visible light. And so these kind of materials are useful for a range of applications, but one of them is in uh, the cockpits of aircraft, uh, for example, or maybe up in Alaska where you have uh, some kind of displays that have to be used out in the field for some reason. Well, it gets cold and the displays don't work. But what you can do is you can make a little heater panel uh, that, uh, and then conduct some electricity through it and heat it up, and then it'll work in that adverse environment. Um, so this is just a, a typical spectral response. You can see that the uh, transmittance of these coatings is, is high in the visible spectral region, but then it uh, comes down in the near infrared. And that's, when you work out the physics, is 
how you get to the point where you can conduct some electrons too. So similar, uh, similar kind of coding can also be used to um, suppress the radiation coming into or out of a device. So how many people have heard of something called a Faraday cage? Good, okay, so Faraday cage completely encloses the stuff inside by having a metal box, right? And so if you have a bunch of a noisy environment out here, it doesn't mess with the stuff inside. But what if you want to actually have a device like an oscilloscope where you want to look in and get some information out of that device by looking at a screen or something? Well, that's a problem if you've got a metal cage around the thing, right? But if you use one of these coatings that, that conducts electrons, but you can also see through it, you can complete the Faraday cage and make, and make it complete, and yet see in and see what the oscilloscope is telling you. Uh, finally, uh, color calibration. Uh, we can make filters that have unusual shapes like this that match the tristimulus curves or the curves that the, the cones of the eye have. And then some manufacturers actually ask for filters with these shapes, put them into devices that have uh, three color imagers, and then they can shoot uh, this device at some color and tell you what what exactly color that is. So that's useful in things like uh, displays, now that displays have become so prevalent to make sure that the colors are calibrated in display. Uh, for many years it's been important in fabrics and in paints, and, and applications like that. Hot and cold mirrors, this is how the dentist can shine the bright light on you. Only the light comes down, the heat is directed away from you, for example. So, let's see, we've talked about a lot of coding types and their applications, ready to move on to process technologies. Any questions up to now? Yes? I was wondering if any of these things have any particular application in optical switching, like when you actually multiplex multiple data lines in the, on different wavelengths. Can you actually use this to separate data lines without going through wavelength conversions and that kind of expensive, is there any relevance? Well, certainly these filters have been used to completely multiplex and demultiplex optical signals. So you might have 100 colors of light coming down one fiber and then uh, a set of filter, a filter bank if you will, a set of a cascade of filters that separates all those wavelengths to the uh, individual various transmitters. And, th and that's very commonly done. Um, there have been schemes to utilize those in more complicated systems where switching is done as well. Um, I think most of the successful technologies, and, and, and there are schemes to do it, but I think more cost-effective technologies are employed that use other kinds of optical means like grading based or, or other kinds of technologies. But I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, uh, almost in the same um, uh, area. Uh, is there any way to switch on and off the effect of the uh, filter? And in fact, that one of the applications could be in the switch, let's say. But uh, is there any way to do that? There are some folks who have worked on um, switchable or tunable filters. Um, one that comes to mind um, used a very interesting technique. They actually made the filter very small and uh, like, like three or four hundred microns on the side and mounted it on uh, a heater, a, a sort of a a heater device that could rapidly heat up and cool down over several hundred degrees Celsius. And because of the thermal shift of the optical coating material, uh, in this case it was hydrogenated silicon, they could ramp through the whole C-band, the whole telecom C-band, uh, by ramping this temperature up and down in something like a second, or it was a very fast sweep that they could make. And they could use that, for example, to make a channel monitor where you wanted to see what signals were on the line and then process that and 
help that with your switching later. That's just one example of that. And how, how fast you can go with uh, the issue there? Because really, in the optical switch, sometimes, for example, in the telephone switches, you want to commit the optical. It really needs to be very, very fast. You know, talking about like, what I can say to this. Right. I'm not familiar with the technology that's on the fast. However, there are electrical, electro-optical materials uh, that could feasibly be used uh, for that kind of application and incorporated in a thing from optical stack. Okay. Well, is it, sorry, sorry the, yeah. what you talked about, isn't that similar to what they use in optical spectrum analyzers? Like, do they use that same thing, the heating element? On the coding, or well, I'm not familiar with all optical spectrum analyzers, but the ones that Agilent makes, for example, use a, a rotating grating-based system, oh. and that rotating grating then sweeps uh, the signal past the detector. Yeah. Um, and I think many of the competitive devices use a similar kind of technology. Okay. So I'm I'm not familiar with. You, uh, I am uh, familiar with some channel monitors being made with that linear variable filter though that we talked about. Um, so there, there's one application where it's, it's not actually tunable electro-optically or thermally, but where you can uh, either move the filter or put a CCD array behind the filter and, and get a, a benefit of that type. So moving on to process technologies, how are these thin foam coatings made? Um, there are a few main technologies um, that are used. Thermal evaporation that we'll talk about briefly. Sputtering, and there are several different types. We'll talk about one of them. <coughs> and uh, then various sorts of chemical vapor deposition that isn't used too much, and we're not going to talk about that one. But basically, uh, in, in creating a thin foam layer, we need to uh, um, there's no reason why, per se, the thin film filter has to be made in vacuum. In fact, there are some emerging technologies where, where coatings are made um, at atmospheric pressure or in other ways. But at least up to this time, the vast majority of optical coatings have been made uh, using vacuum processes. And the, the basic idea here is whether you're evaporating or sputtering, you're, you have a source of material that's being put into a vapor phase somehow. And then uh, co collecting some of that material on a substrate. That's the basis of it. What we do is after we've made one thin layer of bubble stuff, then it's time to move to a layer of air or some other <coughs> material. And we keep alternating back and forth between those. Of course, we can't use bubble stuff. We have to use inorganic you know, analysis and whatever. And then we end up with this stack of um, materials that gives us the engineer the spectral response that we want. Maybe one of the first technologies used widely was evaporation. In evaporation, um, you, you create a molten material or a sublimate material and collect that material on your substrate. Here, um, the, I, can everyone see this picture here? If you want that, I can apply it. It's not that important, but <laughs> this is basically a little little box with well, some, some holes in the first light. Yeah. Well, put the, can you put the first light off? And we'll <coughs> we'll want to turn it right back on again though in a minute. So here you can see this metal box is connected between uh, a common copper part and a, an energized copper part, so the current can run through this thing. And what that does is it heats it up. And uh, the material inside, in this case is zinc sulfide, heats up and escapes through those little holes and then is collected on your substrate. Another kind of thermal uh, evaporation technology uses electron beam sources. In this case, um, an electron beam is directed through a trajectory of 270 degrees from a filament that you can't see down here up to a, a source of material. And that source of material is uh, sublimed or melted. And uh, the vapor, it, you never get to see it in the vapor phase, unfortunately. Kind of like humidity in air. You, you never get a chance to see it. But um, anyway, the, the vapor uh, is collected up on a substrate above. 
So now we can probably get the lights back. Thanks very much. So the kind of coatings that are usually made with when you use this evaporation technology have a structure that is not too desirable. There's, there's lots of pores in the material. It's not of uh, the same density as the bulk material, and that leads to some problems. Uh, moisture, for example, can get into those pores, and uh, uh, when you have a humid day, more moisture gets in the pores, and the, it, the uh, spectral characteristic of the coating moves to longer wavelengths, and then when you have a dry day, some of the moisture escapes out of those pores, and the whole coating shifts down to shorter wavelengths. So not a very nice uh, system. We've, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years since I've been working in this field, a lot of work's been going into making uh, really dense coatings through a couple of different ways. One is uh, accelerated ions that bombard the substrate at the same time as you're depositing the coating. Another way is using sputtering, which also creates energetic particles that that um, create a dense film. So uh, anyway, a little motivation for the process engineering here. Um, this is a picture that shows some of the sorts of ion sources that we can use with evaporation um, to make these dense coatings. So in this example, uh, we might have our substrates up here. They're often uh, in some kind of rotation scheme to assure that we get good uniformity across the whole part. So they're like rotating on the main axis and then rotating in a planetary rotation as well. Here we're showing an electron beam source that's deposit, that's the main source of material, and then one of these ion sources is used in conjunction with that to uh, kind of slam into that growing film to bombard and densify it. This is a, an example of a particularly ugly evaporation chamber. Sputtering is uh, sort of the other main process we use. Um, in, in sputtering, uh, we find through some means or another, we create atoms or ions that have a lot of energy that, that hit a surface made of the material that you want to deposit. We call that a target. Um, and what happens is that thing has so much energy it knocks a few of these atoms out and disrupts them some atoms. Uh, some of these atoms come off uh, with fairly high energies. <coughs> uh, many of them kind of come off with relatively lower energies, but uh, this curve sort of shows a representative uh, distribution uh, of the, the energies that, that come off a sputtering target. Um, these energies work out to be quite a bit higher, though, than you would get with evaporation. With evaporation, the energies are only a few tenths of an EV because it's, it's only the energy of condensation that the, the uh, atom comes away from the melt with. So this is a nice way to get much more energetic particles in the deposition. <coughs> so there are a few different ways to, to create those bombarding atoms. Uh, one of them is to create a plasma above the target through one means or another. And uh, hold that target at a negative potential. So the positively, uh, if you create positively charged ions in this plasma, they'll be attracted to that negatively charged target and do that bombarding thing that we wanted. So uh, uh, one way to enhance that effect is through the use of a magnetron where magnetic fields are actually uh, enhancing the plasma right above that target surface. So just to assure you that this isn't uh, magic that I'm talking about, um, this is an actual picture of one of these plasma discharges going on, so you can see the, the uh, intense plasma above this target material. And you can't, again, you can't see the material that's uh, being knocked away from that target, but, but it's there, and we, we collect it on our substrates. Another technique is called ion beam sputtering. In this case, we have an ion gun where we create a beam of atoms uh, that bombard a target. No magnetron or anything like that. The target, uh, uh, the material ejected from the target is then collected from the substrate. So these are probably two of the most popular means of, of performing sputtering. This, by the way, is uh, a picture of this kind of cathode when uh, the door of the chamber is open and the, the plasma is not going. And so you can see that the profile on that uh, 
target is very uniform and even. It makes it very nice when, from a practical perspective, making a, a, an optical coating, uh, to have a source that's uniformly giving off its material. Sometimes in evaporation, uh, the material can be a little willy-nilly in where it decides to evaporate. It's less predictable and controllable. So, uh, this is an example of one of our prototype sputtering machines where you can see a, a couple of uh, cathodes here with the target surfaces there, and this is where the substrates would be mounted. Uh, just to give you an example of what at, at least uh, an R&D machine <coughs> looks like. So, um, we care about the inside of the chambers uh, for these systems quite a bit because the, the vacuum conditions, uh, we don't want contaminants uh, uh, in, our, in our deposition. We, we want the proper gases to be utilized for, uh, for example, for the working gas for sputtering or for reactive effects. Like when we want to make an oxide, we introduce oxygen, for example. And we also care that the uh, walls don't uh, generate particles. We have a few more coming up, but just to give you an example of how particulates can be had, um, this is an example of, of how our material characterization lab uh, can solve a problem in optical coatings. Here you, you can see what um, we might find by looking under a microscope and, and we see uh, these little domes that you can visualize here. Uh, when we look under a, a scanning electron microscope, we, we magnify one of these domes and, and see something that looks like that. Uh, from there, we can start to uh, actually do something called cross-section, where we take a section through that part and look through one of those nodules, and we actually can pinpoint where that, uh, well, what it is, first of all. It's not, from this, it's hard to tell what it is, but here you can see it started as something small, and it grew. Uh, in, coatings, in, in coatings, we call that a nodule, a nodule defect. And then here, we can actually look at that little region and start to understand where that came from. For example, we can tell this actually was a defect that came from either the wall of the chamber or something of that sort, and, and, and then the nodule started uh, growing from that. We can even find what the material is, and it can help us track down and improve our, uh, track down problems and improve our processes. So what else do we care about? We care about the temperature of the uh, system, to a high degree. For some materials, how well a coating sticks uh, depends on the temperature very sensitively. For other materials, it's less so. And then finally, the geometry of the source and substrate. You saw, for example, that we use those rotary motion systems to make sure our coatings are uniform. So, a um, few key properties of optical coatings. We'll go through this pretty fast, unless there are questions. Um, of course, uh, some important characteristics just relate to the exact spectral shape that a customer wants. If, uh, if uh, somebody is doing anesthesia monitoring and the spectral line is at a certain wavelength, then obviously the filter needs to be set to that particular value and, and uh, within a certain tolerance. Transmittance levels and, and other kinds of characteristics uh, are also important. Durability of coatings is defined through a set of uh, specifications that are uh, that relate to exposing the coatings to humidity or boiling water or pulling tape over the coating, all kinds of torture tests of that sort uh, to make sure that the coatings will survive in the application. So in many applications, surface quality is important. Small defects uh, uh, can um, impact the performance of a coating, especially if the coating is going to be close to a detector, because these detector elements in CCD cameras and CMOS cameras are really getting small. They're under 10 microns in size now. And so if you have a filter that's right above that uh, and the defect is tens of microns in size, well, you've got a problem. Um, some characteristics of the coatings are kind of fundamental to the optics properties like absorption and scatter. Um, absorption is a property often measured in parts per million. It's a, usually very small. There are a number of techniques that can be used to characterize it. 
Um, scatter, also measured often in parts per million and uh, different units for characterizing it and measuring it. This is a, a useful um, expression. You, you know, you can, you can express this as star equals one or tars equals, I like rats. Because <laughs> I can remember, I can remember that one, but this is, in an optical coating, the reflectance plus the absorptance plus the transmittance plus the scatter is equal to unity of the, all the incident light goes into one of those four places. Uh, for some applications, uh, a coating needs to be able to withstand a certain intensity of laser. And so these are just a few pictures of, you know, it's, a really nice coating is pretty boring usually. Huh. It's the ones that, that, it's true in almost anything. It's when you break it that it looks cool. <laughs> so, so here's an example of, of uh, some damaged coatings from a, a CW or continuous wave laser. An example of the kind of damage you can get there. And here's a, a pulse laser <coughs> damage uh, example. So uh, turns out in, in continuous wave laser damage, usually absorption in the coating is the main reason the coating fails. In the case of pulse lasers, usually it's defects, small defects uh, that serve as sites for a, uh, a propagation of the defect. So um, what's new in optical coatings? I'm just going to spend a few minutes and tell you about a, a new process that we've been developing. Well, new, we've had it underway for maybe six or seven years now. But pretty new. Uh, it's based on magnetron sputtering. Um, and uh, we actually coat wafers that are 200 millimeters in diameter. So this is an example of, of one of these kinds of coatings here um, in this plastic shell. Uh, the, the process has relatively high deposition rates, about a nanometer per second. I should say, we, we have these systems, they, they can be interfaced to a, a very good clean room, is one of the uh, factors, uh, useful things about it. We have uh, uh, done a lot of work to make sure that this process is compatible with low defect coatings. Um, and so let me show you a picture of sort of the main elements of the process here. This is, uh, uh, the basic element is that one of those magnetron cathodes that I was mentioning before that has that intense plasma above it. We also have an auxiliary plasma source and an anode that creates the circuit between the, this uh, sputtering cathode and, and an anode. Um, the way the system's designed is it, it produces a very stable deposition uh, over time. Again, we use one of those rotation systems to make sure that the coating is really uniform over each of these uh, little uh, 200 millimeter diameter substrates. This is a, a picture of the system in action. So that's the, the cathode and the, the intense plasma above it. And here you can see a few of the, the substrates. Um, I mentioned that the system incorporates a load lock. That has a couple of tremendous advantages. One is uh, we're, we're, always, we're almost always coding in the system. We're, we we uh, <coughs> pump these parts down in a load lock, and then when we're done with the deposition, we can rapidly exchange the parts using a, a robot. And then uh, while we're unloading these parts, we start these uh, parts coding again. So there's never have to take this process chamber down, or at least only rarely, a couple times a month maybe. So we get a lot more throughput from the set system. Another thing we're, uh, another advantage we're gaining is by not constantly exposing the system to moisture, we don't contaminate the main process chamber nearly as much. So moisture, for example, doesn't get into the chamber walls and uh, uh, create the opportunity for defects to, to I guess the wall to start flaking off and the defects to be formed. So some tremendous advantages there. So by putting the, the main deposition process and the load lock together, we get a, a really advantageous system with uh, probably reduced cycle time, lower defect uh, generation, higher throughput. So a few examples of some filters uh, that we can make with this kind of process. Um, 
in one example, I was talking about the example where a surgeon might want to be wearing some glasses that protects them from, from a laser beam, or you might be working in a lab where you're using several different wavelengths of lasers and you want to wear some glasses to protect yourself. So, so in that case, a, a filter that can uh, block those laser lines that you might be exposed to very well, but transmit all other wavelengths is, is really important. Um, in this case, here's an example of a, of a coating that's uh, blocking those three, three particular laser lines, 458, 515, and 594, uh, to about one part per million blocking while transmitting the rest of the light at about 95%. So this particular coating has 600 layers, it's about 30 microns thick. Um, this is kind of our hero experiment of coatings. In telecommunications, you guys who have worked on that, for, you remember those papers that the guys would give about uh, transmitting the bits around the world uh, 50 times or something and only have some small bit error rate, right? Well, our hero experiment is, is like here, it's, it's a, a coating, an optical coating, that where the coating material is actually an eighth of a millimeter thick. There's 4,400 layers in this coating. In this case, it's uh, uh, a, uh, a coating that uh, rejects 1064, which is the YAG laser line, as it turns out, and uh, transmits very well all other wavelengths. So that's sort of, uh, well, it's the thickest most numerous layer coating that I'm aware of. So uh, you heard it here, okay? <laughs> uh, one example, an important example, is uh, 3D stereoscopic vision. We've made filters that relate to this in a particular application. Uh, in this case, um, uh, you want to pro project a different image to each eye. So how are you going to do that? Um, well, one way is to alternate between the colors, uh, I should say between the images, uh, using this filter wheel that's shown here, and then to have the user wear a pair of glasses. And those glasses are specially designed, as is the filter wheel, so that um, one eye sees <coughs> one set of primary colors, blue, green, and red, and the other eye sees a shifted set of primary colors. And it, it turns out, that we can kind of do an experiment here. And we're not going to be able to see in 3D, but we can at least uh, we can pass some of these glasses out. And on the camera, we can even uh, put the uh, lens over the camera. I, at the right time, I'll let you know. So thanks for passing this out. So here I have the filter that goes, that's used to go over one eye. So if you look at this spot that I'm creating in the white and close one eye and open the other one, you should be able to see that appear and disappear. Now those of you who aren't wearing the glasses, you're not going to see this effect. But, <laughs> but those of you with the glasses on should see it. Now, which eye can you see it? You can see it with the see? right eye. What do you mean by seeing it? You see a, a greenish color when you open your right eye, yes. and you can't. You see black when you open your left eye. It's the other way. Around. Yeah, it's, it's the other way. Around. Oh, okay. Well, I listened to the wrong person. I'm sorry. So the left eye open is is when you can see this one, right? Okay. Yes. So now, the other side of the filter wheel, this one should be right eye open. Yes. You can see the image behind here. Yes. And you'll need to hold those glasses kind of at normal incidence to the lens. Yes. That looks good. Shift it back and forth, maybe. Okay. So, basically, that's how we can in a nutshell, implement stereoscopic 3D uh, using optical filters.
Yeah, this is one of the technologies that's used. There are several different technologies that are used, but this is one of them, yeah. And I'll need those uh, glasses back, okay? Yes. Because in the old days, they were using the polarized and so forth. Polarization is still used, so that's one of the technologies. For the HDTV, maybe these uh, for the HDTV, I think there are a lot of emerging technologies. I don't think the uh, answer is quite there yet. There's, there's some interesting work to be done. Um, so this is a new stereoscopic 3D. This is a painting from 1868 showing this lady as uh, one of these stereoscopes here. But anyway, implementation in movies is a little newer. So there are lots of applications for this new technology. Um, I'd like, at this point, um, like to conclude and uh, maybe have some time for questions. I think our time is up, but sorry about that. Um, so, um, hope I've convinced you that thin film optical coatings are key in uh, optical systems. Uh, most systems use optical coatings of some type or another. Um, you know, that whole telescope is there just to hold our optical coating. Right? Also, um, the field is relatively mature, but there are new developments. And so I hope I should, by showing you the, this UCP1 system, it's kind of a newer way that enables new performances and, and capabilities in our industry. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, open, uh, open up for questions. After, I should say, acknowledging my boss at JDSU, Fred Van Milligan, <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, created many of the slides in this presentation, and other colleagues <coughs> at JDSU who also helped uh, with various parts of it. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you.